Good evening, everyone. My name is Lauren Santiastub, and I'm one of the new HAM faculty here at UCSF in the Department of Orthopedic Surgery. I I'm very happy to be here tonight to try to teach you all something about lumps and bumps of the hand and wrist as we often see these frequently in our hand clinics. And I really thank you for your time and appreciate you taking time away from your normal evening activities and away from your families as well. So thank you for joining us. To start, I would just like to say I have no relevant conflicts or of interest to disclose to you. Um, I'm originally from Indianapolis born and raised a Midwest girl and moved to New York for nine years and finished my training there. And then moved here last year and fell absolutely in love with the Bay Area and was so incredibly thrilled and honored to be a new member of faculty here at UCSF. I have three different clinic locations. My main clinic is in Marin next to Marin General Hospital. I also uh, have a clinic at the Orthopedic Trauma Institute, which is within the San Francisco General Hospital. And we spend a lot of time teaching residents there and taking care of complex hand traumas, you can imagine. And then I also have a new clinic starting this week at, San, at the Orthopedic Institute, which is in Mission Bay. So oftentimes what I get asked when I am told that, when I tell people I'm a hand surgeon is what exactly do I treat? So I treat all hand and upper extremity conditions, primarily focusing on the elbow down to the fingertips. And the nice thing about my job is I get to treat all ages. So kids as young as newborns to patients as old as 100 years of age, everybody has all different types of hand conditions and concerns. And I see all different age groups within my practice. Some of the most frequent things that I treat are numbness and tingling in the fingertips, which can be due to carpal tunnel or cubital tunnel syndrome. Also treat trigger fingers, which is one of the many topics that we'll talk about tonight. That's probably one of the most frequent things that we see in our hand practice. I treat all different types of broken bones within the fingers, the hand, the wrist, the forearm, and the elbow, and even up to the upper arm as well. We often see tennis elbow, which is something that I see frequently in the, in the Marin Clinic especially. We treat ganglion cysts and other masses and tumors of the hand. Dupuytren's contracture, which we'll also get into a little bit tonight. All different types of arthritis within the hand and the wrist. And then the main thing I see at the general hospital are bad traumas, often lacerations or nerve in injuries that require long surgeries and complex surgeries. So that's just to name a few of the things that I treat, but there's all different types of things that hand surgeons see. So tonight I wanted to focus on the most common things that we see, which are lumps and bumps of the fingers, the hand and the wrist. The four topics that I'll be focusing on are trigger fingers, ganglion cysts, hand arthritis, and the last is palmar fibromatosis and Dupuytren's contracture. Uh, hopefully with this talk, you'll have a little bit better understanding of what it is that we do and the things that we see most often. So to go back to basics, we're going to just talk about basic hand anatomy and some things that I'll be referring to. So that way, when I say these things, we have a clear picture of what is going on. So this is just basic pictures of our hands. We all have two hands, hopefully. Um, we have the front of the hand, which is known as the palm. And then we have the back of the hand, which is known as the dorsum of the hand. And then the fingers, as we all know, the thumb, the index, the middle, the ring, and the small finger as well. So I'll talk about all those different things. When we talk about the hand, we usually kind of have a cutoff point between the wrist and the hand. The fingers are connected to the hand and the hand is connected to the wrist. There are a lot of little bones within the hand and I will mention a few of them throughout the talk. So I'll go over a quick review here. The fingertips and the fingers have phalanges, which is the term that we use for the small bones in the fingers. In the index, the middle, the ring, and the small finger, you have three phalanges, and the thumb is a little different. You have two phalanges. The bone that connects the fingers to the rest of the hand is known as the metacarpal, which are these long bones here. And you have five of those, one in each finger. There are eight small bones at the wrist, which have lots of really funny names. And those bones can all be affected with various traumas and arthritis as well. And then these small bones connect to the main wrist joint, which is the radius and the ulna, which are included in that. So all those different terms I'll be using throughout the talk. The other important component of hand surgery is to know the names of the joints. 
then those joints are affected in different pathologies and different things that we see on a day-to-day -day basis. So the blue, air, or the blue area is known as the distal interphalangeal joint, which is basically the very tip of your finger, the joint that lets you bend at the very tip. The proximal interphalangeal joint is in yellow here, and that's its neighbor. That's this knuckle here, which often is affected in a lot of the things that we'll talk about tonight. The metacarpal phalangeal joint is depicted in orange here, and that's the main knuckle that everyone knows. So that's this joint here. The thumb has only one interphalangeal joint because like we talked about, it only has two phalanges. So that's a little bit different than the other joints. And then one of the main parts of arthritis that I treat is the base of the thumb. And this is known as the carpal metacarpal joint, especially the first because of the thumb is the first finger. And that is, um, seen in basal joint arthritis or base of thumb arthritis, which if you, if you look at my hand here, it's basically at the base of your thumb here. The other thing that we have in our hands and we have a lot of them are tendons. So I just wanted to talk quickly about what a tendon is and how it functions. A tendon is something that connects a muscle to a bone. And so this is depicting the brachialis muscle and tendon. And you can see that the muscle starts here on one bone and connects to another, and that's through the tendon, which is this white structure. And what happens is when this muscle fires or moves, it, the tendon pulls the bone and flexes the arm. And so within the hand, we have many, many, many tendons, and the hand is very small and complex and very fascinating to me, especially since it's my job. Um, and so we have flexor tendons, which are on the palm of the hand, and those tendons allow you to bend your fingers and make a fist. And then we have extensor tendons, which are on the back of the hand. And those tendons allow you to straighten your fingers up, allow you to lift your wrist up and give a thumbs up. And those tendons are very important in some of the things that we're gonna talk about tonight. So I just wanted to mention those. The first tendons that we're gonna focus on are the flexor tendons, which in this picture here, you can see they're depicted in red. And flexor tendons are special because they actually travel through a tunnel system, which is known as the tendon sheath. And you can see the pictures of the tendon sheaths here. It's kind of this white band of tissue that goes over the tendons. And what that tendon sheath does is it actually allows for increased efficiency of movement of your fingers. So it allows you to make a fist efficiently in a way that is helpful for you to use for grasping, for gripping, for all of those things. And this is another picture here. Again, the tendon is in red and you can see this tendon sheath, which is here in this white kind of band of tissue. And the one that we're gonna be focusing on first is this particular band of tissue here. So just keep an eye on that and we'll talk about that in just a couple of seconds. Like we discussed, the first thing we're gonna talk about are trigger fingers. So this is another picture showing that flexor tendon, which again, allows you to bend your fingers and make a fist. And that tendon travels through this tunnel or this tendon sheath. And the particular tendon, part of the tendon sheath that is most important and most affected within the trigger fingers is what's called the A1 pulley. That's just what we call it. That's the name for the part of the tendon sheath that's affected. Flexor tendons glide through this tendon sheath. And when we have trigger fingers or patients complain of trigger fingers, what happens is that the A1 pulley or the tendon sheath becomes thickened and inflamed and that can cause it to be more difficult to let that tendon pass through and glide through freely. And over time, as this pulley or this tendon sheath gets really inflamed and swollen, you can imagine that the tendon doesn't like that and gets more pressure applied to it. And the tendon can also become thickened and inflamed. So what I like to use as an analogy for this is it's kind of like a really big truck trying to get through a really small tunnel. And you can see here, if the truck is the tendon and the tunnel is the pulley system or the tendon sheath, if, this is really, if the tendon is really swollen or the truck is really big, it makes it much harder to get through that tunnel and through that, that system. And so this is what happens with trigger fingers. Why this happens, we're not exactly sure. Um, there are a lot of different theories, but nobody has the exact answer. There are certain medical conditions that increase your risk, and these include diabetes and rheumatoid arthritis. 
Others believe that repetitive trauma or repetitive forceful hand activities may lead to trigger fingers. Often patients will present and say, oh, you know, I hit my hand and then I developed some pain and swelling at the base of my finger, and now it's catching and locking and popping. But we don't know exactly why this happens. We do know that it does affect women more often, and it's a very frequent thing. It happens in about two to 3% of just everybody in the world. And in diabetics, it happens in even more, about 10 to 20% of diabetics will have a trigger finger in their lifetime. So it's very common in that patient population. The symptoms, and this is a great video showing exactly kind of what happens. Um, so it's a little gross, so divert your eyes if you feel a little grossed out. But you can see here that this thumb, when, he, when this patient bends the thumb, it kind of gets stuck and he has to almost force his thumb to get it straight. And in this patient, it's her middle finger. And you can see that as she bends it, it kind of clicks and gets popped and stuck in place. And then when she extends her finger, it kind of jolts back, jolts to be straight again. And so often what patients complain about is pain over the A1 pulley, which in your hand itself is located kind of in this area here. They usually have pain right here. Sometimes because the, the tendon gets so swollen, you can actually have a nodule in the tendon or swelling in the tendon, and you can feel a bump in this area as well. We saw the catching of the finger within the video. And what is the worst case scenario when you have a trigger finger is that the finger can actually remain in a locked position. So oftentimes patients will come in and say, I wake up in the morning and my finger's stuck in a fist and I can't get it straight. I have to use my other hand to straighten my finger. And that can be very painful and very uncomfortable as you can imagine. And then the larger issue that we see in patients with this is that they can have stiffness of their proximal interphalangeal joint. And so what that means is this joint here can become stiff and can become so stiff that you actually can't straighten the finger all the way. And that can be a big problem as well. So when you come and see us in the office, what we do is we do a history and we do a physical exam. We ask you how long this has been going on, what types of treatments you have done um, to help with these symptoms or this pain or this, this discomfort. Um, and we also always, most often get x-rays. And the way, reason why we get x-rays is to look for any underlying pathology that could be causing this issue or could be secondary to this issue. And so that's something that we usually get in the office. Just like with anything in orthopedic surgery, the first mode of treatment is rest and anti-inflammatories. Rest is really helpful, especially to avoiding, in avoiding activities that cause the triggering or make the triggering worse. And anti-inflammatories can sometimes be very helpful, especially anti-inflammatories like Tylenol or Advil or even Voltaren gel um, can be helpful to help with the localized pain over that A1 pulley. Lastly, um, splinting is something that some patients find very beneficial and up to 70% of patients can see improvement in their trigger finger if they do splinting, especially at night. The reason is we all sleep like we did when we were babies. So we sleep with our hands curled up, our wrists bent and our elbows bent into our chests. And what happens when that happens is you can get locking of that finger and therefore it can be very painful and stiff in the morning. So sometimes I recommend that patients wear a splint at night to kind of help prevent this locking of the finger and that can help rest the tendon as well. As hand surgeons, we work very closely with hand therapists within the community to help treat our patients. We need them for almost everything that we do. And hand therapy can be very, very helpful, especially in trigger fingers, working on tendon glide exercises, working on desensitization, um, decreased swelling, decreased edema, and also just helping patients realize what bothers them, what causes worsening of their trigger fingers and how to avoid those activities. The more invasive types of treatments that we do for patients with trigger fingers are steroid injections to start. A steroid injection, if you haven't had one, is a mixture of numbing medicine, which is the same thing that you get at the dentist, it's called lidocaine, and it's mixed with a steroid. And what the steroid does is it acts as a anti-inflammatory agent to decrease the swelling and the inflammation that is occurring within the tendon sheath and the tendon itself. And when I do these injections, we always talk about risks and benefits. 
The major risk is that some patients have what's called a flare reaction, where they actually have kind of a hyper inflammatory response to the steroid because it's such a, a small space and it's a large amount of fluid for that small space. So some patients will be really upset with me the first couple of days and then over time it continues to get better. And usually the steroid injection starts working within about a week. What they've shown in the literature is that injections can be very effective, especially the first injection in 60 to 90% of patients. Recurrence of trigger fingers is higher in patients who are diabetic, who have underlying medical conditions that can be risk factors for trigger fingers. And it's also higher in patients who have needed multiple injections. The first injection is usually the most effective and the subsequent injections are less effective. So I rarely recommend more than two injections unless your last injection was years ago and you had recurrence years later. The other and obviously most invasive option is to do a surgery where we actually release that pulley or the tendon sheath overlying that swollen tendon. And so this is a great depiction of what we actually do inside the surgery. It's a small outpatient procedure. It can be done under local anesthesia only where you only need um, a little injection and you're totally awake the whole procedure. It's done in the operating room most often. And we make a small incision in the skin and we go down to the tendon sheath and we make a small cut longitudinally in line with the tendon. So you can see here on the left, the tendon sheath is red and inflamed. That's what they're depicting. And then here you can say there's a cut. And what that does is it basically opens the tunnel and allows that big truck to pass through. So it's a very effective surgery. The nice thing about having the patient awake during surgery is we can actually have you bend your fingers and that way we can check if you're still triggering, if you're still feeling that, that clunking, that triggering, that catching motion. Um, and that's very helpful. After surgery, you're usually in a soft dressing. You go home the same day. The pain is quite minimal, um, but there are risks anytime we do surgery. So it is a procedure but it's something that is definitely considered, especially if you failed non-operative management and failed multiple injections or have recurrence of your symptoms. The next topic that we'll go through are ganglion cysts, which is the most common type of tumor that we see as hand surgeons. About 60% of the tumors or the masses that we see are ganglion cysts. The best news that I can usually tell patients is that they're not dangerous. It's not cancer, it's not gonna to spread to another area. It's a very isolated cyst that occurs in the wrist and the hand. It's fluid filled and the fluid looks like a gel. It's usually clear in color. Um, and what is especially important to realize about ganglion cysts is although the only part we can see is the superficial bubble or the superficial balloon, which has the most fluid, there is what's called a stalk which goes into the joint itself deep inside of the wrist. So I like to compare ganglion cysts to a hot air balloon. The balloon is the part that you can see on the surface that's superficial, that's kind of popping up and looking like a bump. And then the stalk of the cyst is what is the basket of the hot air balloon. And that basket goes deep inside of the joint and that's gonna be important when we talk about the surgery um, in a few moments. Ganglion cysts can be anywhere within the hand. The most common location in about 75% of cases is at the back of the wrist. The second most common location is at the front of the wrist, right where the wrist ends and becomes the hand. And we can also see these cysts in fingers, especially in patients with arthritis, which we'll talk about a little bit. Women are more frequently affected than men. And it usually occurs in younger age groups, usually young women from the age of 20 to 40, but it can really occur at any age. We can even see them in children or very elderly patients. It just kind of depends on the patient. Patients will notice and will come in and say, well, it got a lot bigger and now it decreased in size and then it came back and got bigger again. And that's a very common course for these types of cysts. They can even go away on their own and come back years later or never come back. Patients sometimes complain of pain. And the reason they complain of pain, we think, is because sometimes the cyst gets so big that it can actually push on little nerve endings that are near the wrist. And that causes the pain that's associated, especially with maximal flexion of the wrist or extension of the wrist, depending on what's happening. Stiffness can also be a complaint that patients have. Patients that have cysts on the back of their wrist often complain that they have difficulty doing yoga or push-ups because they can't get their hand flat on a, on 
uh, surface due to the pain and discomfort and stiffness in the wrist. So when you come to see me, we would do a history and physical. I would ask you how long this is going going on, what's bothering you, where the mass is located, why it bothers you, and what treatments you've tried so far. We always get x-rays in these cases. The reason we do that is sometimes there can be damage to the underlying bones or the underlying joints. And if their cyst is at the tip of the finger, we'll talk about that, that can be often associated with arthritis. Patients who have a cyst on the front of their wrist, like this patient in the lower right-hand corner, usually I recommend getting an ultrasound or an MRI. The reason for that is there is an artery that's called the radial artery. It's what you check when you check your pulse that goes to your hand and supplies the blood supply to your hand. You do have another artery on this side of the wrist, but depending on certain patients, sometimes this cyst can look like a cyst, but it actually can be an injury that happened to the artery. So we like to make sure with an ultrasound or an MRI that it is what we think it is, and then we can discuss further from there what our treatment options are and what we recommend. The first treatment option is observation. Like I said, resolution that spontaneously occurs can happen, and it happens in about 50% of patients. Sometimes it might come back and get bigger and then go away again, but it often happens. The main thing I do not recommend, as can be seen in this picture, is to not do the Bible aspiration test, which is often seen in the internet if you search Dr. Google. And I do not recommend that you do this because it's very dangerous. You can imagine you can break your hand, you can break, you can hurt tendons or ligaments inside of the wrist. So I do not recommend that you do that. Another treatment option that I offer for patients that have cysts on the back of the hand, or excuse me, the back of the wrist or the tips of the fingers is there, we can take the fluid out. This is a procedure known as aspiration. It can be done in the office. Um, the, problem with this is you can imagine that we can get the fluid out, but we can't necessarily reach the base of the stock or the basket of that hot air balloon. And so recurrence happens in more than half of patients that aspiration is done in. So unless a patient really pushes me to do this, I don't generally do it. And I especially do not perform aspirations if the cyst is on the front or the palm of the hand, because like I said, that can is very close to the artery and you can damage the artery in the office. The last treatment option is surgical excision. The problem with surgical excision is what I always tell patients is you exchange a bump for a scar. So you have a bump and you don't like the appearance of the bump, but then you're gonna have a scar on the wrist as well. So there's going to be something that looks abnormal about your wrist. Scars do heal nicely. And for the most part that we don't have to make very big scars, but it just depends. The risk of recurrence, even with surgical excision is about five to 10%. So that's important to realize as well that they can always come back even if you get them taken out with surgery. And you can see here that again, the hot air balloon, what we have to do in the surgery is not only take off the cyst, but we also have to go down into the joint and remove a piece of, we have to remove the stock and then the tissue that surrounds the stock, which is the joint capsule. And that helps decrease the risk of recurrence. But you can imagine that when we do that, you can have a lot of stiffness after surgery because you have to go down deep inside the wrist joint and remove the tissue that surrounds that area. So it's just something to realize that it is surgery. It's a procedure. You're going to have a scar and you can have risks such as stiffness afterwards. Usually therapy helps decrease that stiffness, but that can still be there. The next topic is a very big topic. So I tried to simplify it as best as I could. And hand arthritis is very dependent on the patient, what joint is affected and how much it affects their life and what they do in their activities. So we'll talk a little bit about that. I'm sure you know this, but arthritis is basically inflammation of the joints and joints move smoothly because of articular cartilage, which covers the ends of the bone near the joint. And this allows for smooth movement and the joints are also lubricated by a fluid that helps the joint move easily. There are a lot of different types of arthritis that we can see in the hand, but the two most common types are degenerative, also known as osteoarthritis, and rheumatoid or inflammatory arthritis. Degenerative arthritis occurs due to natural wear and tear and use of your hands, and it can also occur after a traumatic event, such as if you break your bone or you sprain your joint. And as arthritis worsens, the more and more cartilage that gets damaged this leads to less smooth motion and a rougher joint surface. 
And so you can have pain and swelling because the bones rub up on each other. And then also the joint lining can swell and cause pain and inflammation, which can cause more pain. And it can be a nasty cycle that kind of just perpetuates itself. So patients that come to see me often have kind of lumpy looking hands, unfortunately. They can have pain. The pain that they describe is usually a dull pain or a burning type pain. And that pain usually occurs with increased activity. So repetitive gripping or grasping. Um, base of thumb pain is often pain with opening jars, pain with turning the key, although most cars don't have keys that you actually have to turn anymore. Um, but even turning the key in the house as well, those things can be very painful. And the pain may not happen immediately while they're doing the activity. Often they say, oh, it hurts at the end of the day if I've done a lot of gardening or I've done a lot of work around the house or it may even hurt the next day or the following day. And oftentimes this pain is worse in the morning and it usually gets better, especially the stiffness gets better after you kind of massage your hands or use your hands early in the morning after you wake up. The pain is often relieved with rest and anti-inflammatory medications like Advil or Aleve. Um, it can often, patients can often have worsening pain with changes in weather, and we think that's due to pressure changes within the joint. It can happen, you can see swelling, you can see redness around the joint. And then the other thing you can see is mucus cysts, which we'll talk about a little bit and what those are and why they pertain to arthritis. So oftentimes patients will come in and say, why are my hands lumpy? And we'll talk about that a little bit. But these are frequent, these are hand, pictures of what hand arthritis looks like on the outside and what we see in the office. And you can see that these patients have swollen joints, that the joints are kind of abnormal. They may look a little crooked. They may have lumps underneath the skin. And they may not have totally straight joints as well. They may be partially curved or contracted. And that can happen with arthritis. The types of bumps that we see in arthritis have names, the first of which is the Heberden's node. That's located at the distal interphalangeal joint, which is a big fancy word for the tip of your finger, the joint at the tip of your finger. And you can also have Bouchard's nodes, which are the joint, the second joint of your finger there. And those nodes are called different things just based on the location and what, where the arthritis is located. And we think this happens because you can see here in the normal joint, the bone is nice and smooth. But when you get arthritis, you get what are called bone spurs or osteophytes, and those kind of poke out at the sides, and that causes more swelling and more inflammation. We get x-rays, and this is a great example of normal, a normal finger and an arthritic finger. So on the left, this is the tip of the finger here, and the hand is down here, not pictured. And on the right, it's the same position, so the tip of the finger is here, and the rest of the hand is not pictured here. And what you can see on the left is the joint is nice and smooth. It's concentric. It looks like a kind of like a circle here. And there's lots of space between the joints. And that space correlates with the cartilage that's present at the tips of the bones within the joint itself. As you can see on the right, there's almost no joint space. You can maybe see a little bit of space right here. You also see increased density. The bone looks almost more white than this bone here. And the reason that happens is because the bone density changes due to the different pressures in the joint. And then you also have bone spurs or osteophytes, which are here. You can see this kind of extra poking out of this bone here. And that forms because of the arthritis that's going on within the joint itself. Mucus cysts are frequently seen. Um, and they're often seen with patients that had x-rays that looked like they did on the right side. This is an example of a mucus cyst. And I don't know if you can remember from the other pictures, it looks a little different than the nodes that we see or the bumps and lumps at the joints. The reason it looks a little different is because it's a different thing. This is a ganglion cyst. It's a type of ganglion cyst. This occurs often because of underlying arthritis and bone spurs within the joint. And that causes kind of leakage of fluid of the joint to the surface of the skin. And the skin overlying these is very, very thin and often you can see the fluid within the cyst looks clear to, to the naked eye. And what can also happen with these cysts is they can actually put pressure on the part of the, of the nail bed that creates the nail plate or the hard part of the nail. So you can see in this picture how this patient has kind of abnormal findings of the nail bed here. The nail looks normal on the left side, but on the right, it looks kind of flattened and misshapen. 
And that's because of the pressure that is applied to what's called the germinal matrix of the thumb or the finger, excuse me. Sometimes these cysts can go away on their own. Sometimes because the th skin is so thin, they can actually pop on their own. You might see clear fluid that comes out. And that's okay if that happens, that's pretty common. The thing you have to watch out for are signs and symptoms of infection. And what that would entail would be increased redness, increased pain, pus coming out of this cyst instead of a clear jelly-like fluid. And those are all things that you should talk to your doctor about that's happening. And then these can also spontaneously resolve just like the other ganglion cysts that we talked about. They can change in size, they can get bigger, they can get smaller, all those things can happen. When we see patients with arthritis, we have to think about a lot of different things. One, we have to see how severe their arthritis is. If it's more mild, I'm more likely to recommend resting and anti-inflammatories. If it's more severe, I'm more likely to recommend surgery. The number of joints is important, especially when we're looking at osteoarthritis or degenerative arthritis versus a more inflammatory or autoimmune picture. The age of the patient's very important, their activity level, what things they want to do, what things they want to get back to are important to discuss. Any underlying medical conditions can give us hints as to why they have the arthritis. Obviously, if it's arthritis on your dominant hand, that's going to be more bothersome to you because you use that hand more frequently. And then ultimately, it's all about maximizing patient goals and seeing what they want to get out of their treatment for their hand arthritis. There are lots of different treatment options that we have. The most important of which, in my opinion, are resting and splinting. The reason why arthritis hurts, we think, is that the more you move the joint, the more swelling and inflammation that occurs, and therefore, the more pain that you have. And that's kind of a vicious cycle, like I said. So what I like to recommend first and foremost is just resting the joint and immobilizing the joint. And then the hand, that's really hard because we have to use our hands for everything we do all day long. So I like to recommend splints that are small, that aren't cumbersome, that are easy to take on and off, that you can use if you're just doing your activities, but if you're sitting at home watching TV, you don't need to wear them. And so these are examples of different types of splints that I recommend to patients. I often recommend they go to hand therapy to make these splints so that they're custom to their finger, they're comfortable, they can check and adjust the splints as needed in case they, they are uncomfortable or cumbersome for the patient to use. And they can also work on different swelling and anti-inflammatory techniques and different ways of avoiding activities that really bother your hands. So especially Bates of thumb arthritis, there's all different types of techniques that the occupational therapist has and different tools that they have at their disposal to give you in order to use your hands as you need to. So if you have trouble opening jars, they have tools and ways of doing that without using your thumb so it doesn't hurt you as much. Steroid injections, like we talked about for trigger fingers are always an option. A steroid injection, again, includes the lidocaine mixture with the, the steroid itself. That is a little bit harder of injection to give just because it's a deeper structure within the joint and you're putting a lot of fluid into a small space. But those steroid injections can be very beneficial and can really help decrease that inflammatory process and that vicious cycle and help with your pain and your symptoms. The problem with steroid injections, it doesn't reverse the arthritis. We don't have a magic pill or a magic wand that we have at this time to decrease the risk of arthritis or to help build that cartilage back up, but it can really help with pain control and allow you to get back to the things you want to do. For surgery with mucus cysts, we'll talk about that first. Um, this is one of the most common things that I see in regards to arthritis. And I often try to dissuade patients from getting this surgery. And there's a couple of reasons why. Um, the cysts can come and go, like we talked about. It's not the easiest procedure in the sense that you think it's really easy to just take this little lump out, but we have to do the same thing we did with the ganglion cysts where we take the stalk of the cyst out and the hot air balloon out of the joint. And in addition to that, you actually have to get rid of that bone spur, or that osteophyte that's present at the joint and within the arthritis. And the reason we have to do that is to decrease the risk of recurrence. Recurrence in mucus cysts after surgery is about 5% of the time. So it comes back less than ganglion cysts, but it is still a common thing to have come back. And there are risks of this surgery. There is an important tendon that allows you to straighten your finger that's at the tip of your finger that can get damaged. Um, the skin on the cyst is often very thin, and so that skin can break down and you can have wound problems. And then the other reason why the surgery is a little tricky technically is that the matrix that builds your nail that can be pushed on by the cyst can also be damaged within the surgery. 
So unless it's very bothersome and cumbersome or very painful, I don't recommend surgery. Um, or if they've failed everything else and it's just not working for them, then we move forward with surgery. But I usually like to counsel patients extensively on that surgery. The other types of surgery that we do for arthritis, there's a whole wide array of things that we do. Um, the picture on the left is depicting a fusion of the distal interphalangeal joint, which again is the joint at the tip of the finger. We do that for arthritis of that joint, where we actually open the joint, remove the cartilage, put the joint together, and put a screw across it. The problem with that surgery is afterwards, you can never bend that joint again. And that's the purpose of it is to help rest it. It kind of acts like a splint um, of that joint and prevents you from bending it. But the nice thing about it is it does get rid of the pain within the joint itself. Some types of surgery that we can do besides fusion of the joint is we can actually do an arthroplasty. This is a picture of a silicone arthroplasty on the right. It's used in very specific circumstances. And again, this is why this talking about arthritis is so difficult because there's so many different scenarios that we see and different joints that are affected. This can only be done in certain types of joints and certain types of arthritis. Um, but the nice thing about this is instead of fusing the joint and preventing motion, we actually allow for some motion of this joint. The joint motion will never be like your normal fingers. It will never be 100%, but at least gives you more motion to have a more functional hand. And then the last type of surgery that we do is known as an arthroplasty slash suspension plasty. This is done primarily at the base of the thumb, which is one of the most frequent types of arthritis that we see. And this is a picture showing that procedure. So the base of the thumb, this is the thumb here, and this is the index finger. And this is the base of the thumb and the joint that gets affected, which is known as the carpal metacarpal phalange, metacarpal joint, excuse me. And the arthritis occurs at the base of the metacarpal and within this bone here, which is known as the trapezium. The surgery that we do is we actually remove the trapezium in, in its entirety most often. And we do what's called a suspension plasty where, and there's lots of different ways to do it. This is just one technique, but where we actually suspend the, the thumb joint to the index finger. And that keeps the bone and the thumb in the right position, but gets rid of the arthritis on one half of that joint. And that's a pretty tough surgery to recover from. If any of you have had that, it does take a long time to have the swelling and inflammation calm down. Um, and it can be a painful procedure. The last thing I wanna talk about and address are some lumps and bumps that I see a lot. Um, this is known as palmar fibromatosis and Dupuytrens. It's a mouthful to say the least. This is a genetic disease. And it's also known as the Viking's disease because Viking heritage seems to be kind of part of the original gene pool. And the patients who are most frequently affected are those whose families come from the path of the Vikings conquests in the past. So patients of Northern European descent or Scandinavian descent are most often affected. It affects men much more frequently than women at about a seven to one ratio. So seven men to one woman are affected by Dupuytrens and palmar fibromatosis. And it's a disease that affects the fascia of the hand. So the palmar fascia is pictured here. And what it is, is basically a fibrous layer of tissue that lies just underneath the skin on the palm and the fingers. And what that does is it helps to anchor and stabilize the skin to the palm. So if you look at your hand and you kind of try to move the skin on your palm around, it moves a little bit, but it's pretty stiff. It's pretty tight. If you go to the back of your hand and try to lift your skin up, it's really flexible, it's really easy to move. And so that's the difference. The palmar fascia is only on the palm and it's not on the back of the hand. And that's why we see this issue on the palm of the hand and not the back of the hand. And if you imagine without this fascia in the palm of your hand, then the skin on the palm of your hand would be just as flexible as the skin on the back of the hand. And so it allows you to do specialized tasks like grasping and gripping with your hands. The other interesting thing is this fascia, there's something similar in your feet as well. So we'll talk about that a little bit. The first kind of detection that we see is something that are known as nodules or nodes. And those are usually part of the palmar fibromatosis picture that then can extend into the Dupuytren's umbrella. And nodules are seen here on the left. They start off as kind of like a raised bump, almost looks like a callus in the palm of your hand. And you can see pitting around the, around the nodule. And the reason why pitting happens is you can imagine the nodule is kind of a mountain and the pitting is kind of a valley. So as the scar tissue forms, 
in the nodule, then you can get a valley around it and that causes the pitting in the fingers. And then these kind of nodules can become, and the bands of fascia can become thickened and turn into cords. And these kind of look like ropes. And oftentimes patients will say, oh, my tendon is really prominent here. It's actually has nothing to do with the tendon. It has to do with the tissue on top of the tendon, but that can really tether the finger. And you can see here in the picture on the right, the fingers are tethered so much by these cords that it actually causes a contracture where the fingers are inside the palm and can get stuck in that position. There are multiple risk factors that we've identified that are part of this picture. The first is gender. Men are more often affected. Ancestry is something you obviously can't affect. It's what you were born with and the genetics that you have. Alcohol use and tobacco use have been shown to um, be risk factors for Dupuytren's contracture and more severe Dupuytren's contracture. They think that's because it increases free radicals, which they think can lead to this tissue forming in the hand. Diabetes and HIV are also risk factors for Dupuytren's. Um, so those are all things that we see as, and we ask patients about when they come and see us in the office. And this is another great example of kind of what we see and what your hand may look like. So you actually get a real picture of what it looks like. You can see here, there's this nodule, that's the mountain. And then the pit is the tissue that's just kind of sunken in because of the valley of, that's next to the mountain. So that's what that looks like at the beginning. And then what that can turn into is a cord-like structure that actually can extend into the finger and cause the finger to bend down and not be able to straighten all the way. So when patients first come in with nodules or nodes, they can be very tender to palpation, especially at the beginning. And they think that's just due to acute inflammation in the hand. And that usually goes away with time, but sometimes, especially if you're doing repetitive labor or activities where you use a lot of grasping and gripping, those nodes can become tender. One thing that's important that I tell patients is you have to check that you can get your hand flat on a table. So this is the flat table test. So if you put your hand on a table or a counter and you can see here, the pinky finger is nice and flat. And then this ring finger is kind of elevated and the patient can't get it flat on the table. When that happens, you should see a hand surgeon because we can do things that are less invasive and less aggressive early on in the disease process, but as the disease process gets worse and the contracture of the fingers get worse, it makes the surgery and the treatments much more difficult to do. And the risk increases for you as the patient as well. Other things that we see in patients that have Dupuytren's or polyphibromatosis is contractures like we've talked about. There may be trouble straightening the fingers. They may also have difficulty spreading the fingers apart. So abducting the fingers or spreading your fingers apart. And you can see here that in this picture, the ring finger almost overlaps with the middle finger. And the reason for that is you have fascia that goes in the web space, which is the space between the fingers here. And that can also affect, be affected within Dupuytren's. Other things that we see are Garrett's pads, which are a little different than the nodes that we saw with the arthritis. They're usually a little fluffier, a little softer, and a little bit more superficial. Those usually happen on this joint, which again is called the proximal interphalangeal joint. Um, and those may or may not go away with time. They're usually not painful. They just kind of look a little funny. And then like I talked about, you can have this fascia on the, on the base of your feet as well. And so this is called Lederhose's disease which is where you can get a similar disease in the fascia of the feet. And so whenever patients come and see me, I ask, do you have any similar bumps or lumps or contractures of your toes? Um, that can in indicate more severe disease. And then in men, something that can happen is Peyronie's disease, where you can actually see these lesions or these nodules on the penis itself. And that can also be indicative of a more severe disease. So those are all important questions to you and things to address with your doctor. History and physical exams, very important, especially the history in patients like this. We always ask, do you have any family members with this disease? How have they been treated? I usually ask when this started. If it started at a young age in your 20s, it's more likely that you have a more severe disease process. Um, and some patients will live with this for their whole life and it never bothers them. But that's something that's important to ask. I always obtain x-rays and that's specifically to look at the joints and to see that they look concentric and that there's no arthritis or any underlying deformity. The first point of treatment is of course observation. I tell patients, especially if they just have some nodules or some palmar fibromatosis, the early stage of the disease, that they should test their hand once a month, make sure they can lie it flat on a table. And if they can't, they should come back and see me sooner rather than later so we can address those issues early on. 
The next method of treatment is a steroid injection, especially if those nodules are very painful or tender. That can help decrease the pain and the tenderness. It does not necessarily prevent progression of the disease, um, but that is a very helpful option for patients. An enzyme injection can be done as well. Some hand surgeons do this procedure. The enzyme is called collagenase. It's a big fancy word for something that dissolves a certain type of collagen. And it dissolves the collagen that's specific to this fascia and to the disease process and not the collagen that's inside of your tendons and your nerves and your arteries. The procedure is done in two visits. You get an injection and then the following week you get in a manipulation where the surgeon actually kind of stretches the fingers out. That manipulation can be uncomfortable. As you imagine, if your fingers have been tight for a long time, when you stretch those fingers, you can have skin tears because the skin has been kind of scarred down. And so that can be an uncomfortable procedure, um, but it is an option to do that's a little less invasive than surgery. A needle after neurotomy is what I prefer to do in the office. <clears throat> this procedure is done with you wide awake. You're in my office. <clears throat> and what happens is we, I basically inject a very small amount of numbing medicine to the skin and I insert a larger needle and I use that needle to make poke holes in that fascia and then to basically cut the fascia. The risks of this procedure are that you can have damage to nerves and blood structures in this area. The fascia runs here and the nerves and the blood vessels are right next door. So those can be damaged. So that's why I recommend that you are wide awake for this procedure because you can participate. And if you feel any sharp pain or any um, zingers or kind of nerve type symptoms that go to the tip of your finger, that can mean I'm too close to the nerve and I need to move my needle away from where I am. So it's really important that the patient participates actively in, that, in this process. Once we cut the fascia, we also do a manipulation just like the collagenase injection. And that manipulation is, can be a little uncomfortable, but I find it's usually maybe a little less painful than the manipulation with the enzyme injection. And then the other option for severe disease or patients that have failed other treatment options is to do a fasciectomy. It's a big fancy word for basically removing that scar tissue, removing that fascia. And we do that through a variety of different ways. We do zigzag incisions up and down the finger. And what that does is it allows the skin to stretch and to close the skin well. And we, when we do this procedure, we protect the nerves and the blood vessels. However, every time we do surgery, every time we do any procedure for this condition, there's always risk of damage to nerves and blood vessels. And especially patients who have very severe disease, there are, there's more of a risk because when your hand has been like this for 20 years, you can imagine if you stretch it out, it stretches those nerves, it stretches those blood vessels. And so those can be very irritating. And the other issue is that patients that um, have severe disease are much more likely to have recurrence. So patients with more fingers involved, patients with fingers involved on both hands, patients that have had the disease for a very long time, and patients that have other areas of disease like the Dupuytrens of your feet are all at increased risk of recurrence. And so those are important points to talk to patients about as well and to discuss with your doctor. Mm -hmm.